The scripture today comes from Romans 8, 26, 39. You can find it in a few Bibles on page 158 in the New Testament. Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that every spirit intercedes with signs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. For those whom he predestined, he also called. And for those whom he called, he also justified. And for those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation, (laughs) will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. In the silence of the stars, in the quiet of the hills, in the heaving of the seas, you speak, O Lord. In the words of the prophets, in the message of the apostles, you speak, O Lord. Now we pray, speak in this place, in the calming of our minds and in the longing of our hearts. Speak, O Lord, for your servants listen. It's in Christ's name and spirit we pray. Amen famous author that you all know, Ernest Hemingway, was an infantryman and an ambulance driver during World War I. He was a war correspondent in the Spanish Civil War and in World War II. In peacetime, he was an avid sportsman and hunter of big game in Africa and deep sea fishing on the coasts of the Key West and Cuba. He traveled the world extensively. His novels hit the bestseller list time after time. In winning the Pulitzer Prize in 1953 and the Nobel Nobel Prize for Literature in 1954, he established a place for himself as one of the greatest American authors of all time. By most standards, he had it all. He had the world (laughs) by the tail. but it must not have been enough. Discouraged and despondent, he shot himself in a cabin in Idaho in 1961. 
the number of people who commit suicide after experiencing fame and fortune of worldly success is astonishing. Millionaire George Vanderbilt killed himself by jumping from a hotel window. Lester Hunt, twice governor of the state of Wyoming, before being elected to the United States Senate, ended his own life. Actress Marilyn Monroe, again writer Ernest Hemingway, and athlete Tony Lazera represent the most highly influential people, popular people, who became so disheartened with worldly, worldly earthly goods and success that they took their own lives. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Those words written by British vaudeville actor George Powell were set to a cheerful melody by the, his piano playing brother Felix. It earned Felix over $60,000. Yet one day, years later, Felix sat down at the piano and played that well-known melody, Smile, Smile, Smile. Then he went into a room where he was all alone, and he shot and killed himself. Today is our sixth week of this sermon series, Healing in Grief. Our sermon today is titled Unsanctioned Grief. Grief is a reaction to a loss. It is caused especially by the death of a loved one, but it can also be caused by divorce, betrayal, desertion of a loved one, moving, the loss of a job, sickness, the loss of cultural elements, destruction of our normal conditions of life, and many, many other things. Some losses carry a stigma of society. It is if grief experienced due to certain types of loss, are, although unspoken as such, are classified by our society as unsanctioned and illegitimate. Some of those losses are when people have died from AIDS-related related complications, when people have suffered miscarriages or stillbirths, when criminals die in prison or are executed by the state, and also suicides. One famous criminal that was executed by the state could also have been classified as a suicide. Anybody know who that was? Anybody remember the name Jesus Christ who marched to Jerusalem to die for you and me? Intent, knowing what was going to happen to him, still went to Jerusalem. Marched straight to Jerusalem. He was put to death by the Roman government, by the state for being a seditionist, a criminal. Suicide is an act of taking one's own life voluntarily or intentionally. Just like any other death, suicide is no respecter of age, race, gender, social standing. Since the fourth century, suicide has been looked upon as an unpardonable sin. The early church actually approved of self-sacrifice and martyrdom. And according to Paul Pretzel, suicide up until the 4th century was quite common in the early church. We still today put a stigma on those who grieve from suicide or from people who have miscarriages. How many people know somebody that's had a miscarriage? They grieve just as much as somebody who had a still alive birth and raised a child. They say that people who have miscarriages have already 
come to know that child as a living creature, as a living human being. Abimelech in Judges 9 was the first. Samson in Judges 16 was the second. Saul and his armor bearer in 1 Samuel 31 were the third. Ahipothel in 2 Samuel was the fourth. Zimri in 1 Kings was the fifth. And Judas Iscariot in Matthew 27 was the sixth. How many times have we heard the words, God doesn't put any more on us than we can handle? Anybody ever hear that? It's a phrase somebody says all the time to people that are going through trials and tribulations. God doesn't put anything more on you than you can handle. Really? The Christian maxim is a well-meaning attempt at putting our difficult times into perspective. It holds the view that God knows our weaknesses and knows when we can't measure up to the challenge. But if we're going through the trials and the tribulations, the same saying can be debilitating to each and every one of us. When we feel that we can't possibly handle the situation. It may be that God does not give us more than we can handle. But this is actually, perhaps, strangely, a source of comfort sometimes. If we could handle every circumstance in life, you probably wouldn't have suicides, would you? So is God a liar? Is that the scripture verse? If we can handle every circumstance, we would never reach the end of our self-reliance on God. The scripture people that are referring to when they say God doesn't give us any more than we can handle actually says this, and it's in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. It says, no testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. In other words, everybody goes through trials and tribulations in this life. Nobody is exempt. God is faithful, it says, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with that testing, God will pro also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure it. Now, does that sound like God doesn't put any more on you than you can handle? You see, God doesn't cause trials and tribulations in your life. We live in a fallen world where things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Good things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. Scripture tells us that the rain falls on the righteous just as much as it does the unrighteous. No one's exempt. We live in a fallen world, and as long as we live on this earth, death is no respecter of age, trials and tribulations is no respecter of age, race, gender, creed, or social status. Each and every one of us. But you see, it says that God is faithful, that he will supply a way out. Might not be the way we're looking all the time. But God will supply a way out. Sometimes it could be a little rowboat when your house is starting to flood and this little rowboat comes rowing by because you've been praying, God, help me, save me. And you look at this little rowboat and you say, I got this, I'm praying God's going to save me. And the water keeps rising, and pretty soon you're up in your attic, and you're standing at your upstairs window, and here comes this motorboat running by. And the guy says, come on, I'll give you a ride. 
I'm praying God's going to save me. Goes up on the roof. And the water gets so deep he drowns. Goes to heaven and he meets God there. And he's mad. He's furious at God. He says, I was praying for you to save me and you didn't save me. You wouldn't save me. Why didn't you save me? God said, I sent a rowboat. It wasn't good enough for you. Then I sent a motorboat and you wouldn't take the ride. You made the choice. God will provide a way out of our trials and our tribulations. Sometimes it's not what we're looking for. But I guarantee you God will make a way a story of a boy that was talking about suicides and other unsanctioned and illegitimate grief and I was told this week about a boy who was eight year, in the 8th grade at Grace Chapel so you know how long ago that was because Grace Chapel hadn't had an 8th grade in a while right they only go to 5th grade now right and then they go to middle school well, this eighth grade boy was playing with a gun. He had one bullet in it. He flipped the chamber, put it to his head, pulled the trigger, and it went off. He was playing with his friends, playing with the gun. One family member was at the funeral home. Several of his teachers went to the funeral home to pay their respects to him and the family. One of the teachers said to the father, you know, we're sorry for your loss. His explanation was he got what he deserved. Unsanctioned and illegitimate grief. Prior to the fourth century, suicide was known to happen. Even in the early church, martyrdom was an accepted practice. If you're in the military and a hand grenade falls in your foxhole, what happens a lot of times? You hear stories of it all the time. Someone has to commit suicide to save everybody else, don't they? A lot of times your buddy throws his body across this hand grenade. We've seen it in the movies, but it actually happens. Scripture tells us that blessed are those who mourn. It also says something about giving your life for your friends. Greater love has no man. But isn't that suicide? We don't look at it like that, but it truthfully is. God is faithful in all circumstances. We live in a society that believes in the I factor. It is all about what we can do for ourselves. We hear this all the time. Isn't that what we teach our children when we have them on little league teams and nobody loses and everybody gets a turn to bat, nobody strikes out? We're teaching our kids that everything's fair in life. When kids go to school and they actually fail the grade because they're either not doing the work or they can't do the work and they pass them anyway. I know any of you have never seen that happen, right? We're setting these kids up for failure in life because when reality strikes and when life hits them, life isn't fair. We try to protect our children from discovering that the world isn't fair. We teach them fairness. We teach them how not to handle life situations. And then when reality strikes, they're unprepared to handle the world the way the world really is when trials and tribulations come. And some choose to take a permanent solution for what, in most cases, is a temporary situation. 
Our scripture lesson this morning is different from any others that Paul has written. And it's found in, or found in the New Testament. Paul is writing to the church at Rome. And he, it's a church that he hasn't personally planted. It's a church that has developed on its own by somebody else. They are Jewish Christians that are in Rome. And some Roman citizens that have turned to Christ. Paul is reflecting on trouble and dissension. He corresponds. They don't correspond with Paul first, though. He initiates the letter. Paul, however, is writing this letter as a herald or an introduction to the church at Rome because he wants to travel to Rome to use it as a, a jumping-off place. He wants to use it for a headquarters so that he can use it to reach Spain and to preach the gospel in Spain. He wanted to use Rome as his base of operations as he had in Antioch in Syria. Paul is saying through verses 24 and 25, it is hope that carries us through our times of suffering. So it is the Spirit who comes to our aid and we find ourselves unable to pray, as it said in 26 and following 27. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us because there's some times when we're in such dire straits. I know anybody, nobody's been there, right? When you're in so dire straits that you don't even know how to pray or what to pray for, but you know you have to pray. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit's already there praying for you. He's got the words. He's got your mind. He's got your heart, and he's got your back. You know, they used to say in the Navy, watch your six. Well, the Holy Spirit's got your six. He's already there. He's already interceding for you. Even when you don't know how to pray, He's already praying. As a community of the faith, we need to embrace all of those who suffer any type of grief whether it's sanctioned or unsanctioned, whether death comes from natural causes, accidental causes, miscarriage, abortion, AIDS-related death, death of a prisoner or state-sanctioned execution, or even suicide, or any other deaths. We need, as a church, as a community of faith, we need to embrace that family. We need to hold them up and love them through their grief. We need to be with them. Suicide or any other of these deaths, however, does not place the victim outside of the realm of God or of God's grace. There is absolutely nothing according to Scripture, suicide or anything else that can ever drive a wedge between you, the children of God, and their Heavenly Father. Think about that. There is absolutely nothing that can come between you and the grace of God. It is true that life contains a full share of hardships, but God's already at work in the circumstances of life to conform those to whom he has chosen. In other words, you have given your life to Christ. He's already at work in your life to conform you. into the image of his son. The process is God's. We are his workmen or his workmanship. Our journey to sanctification is intended to bring us into conformity with the nature of our God, the nature of our creator. What scripture tell us about God? I've said it and said it and said it. God is what? Come on, folks. God is love. Love, love, love. You can't interpret the Old Testament and God without going through the essence of Jesus Christ. 
through the lens of Jesus Christ, we can interpret God and see God and know God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. I and the Father are one, and God is love. And as a community of faith, we need to be love as well. Let us pray. Oh God, who brought us to birth and in whose arms we die, in our grief and shock contain us and comfort us. Embrace us with your love. Give us hope in our confusion and grace to let go into new life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name and spirit we pray. Amen. And if you would, would you stand and turn to page 509 in your hymnals and let's stand and sing, Jesus, Savior, pilot me.